Okay. Uh, so, um, we are, uh, I don't know if you noticed, we have three panels in this school. One was about the past, one is about the present, and the other is about the future. So we are now in the present. And we have three panelists. Um, Michali we already met, so... No, yeah. She does not deserve another introduction. Um, Morni Tsan is a faculty member at multiple faculties of the Hebrew University, mainly the computer science. Uh, she's a physicist by training and did her independent postdoc at Harvard and at the Broad Institute. Um, Ora Foreman is a professor of medicine. <laughs> um, you cannot Sorry. deny that, but... <laughs> Uh, she did her PhD here at the Hebrew University and a postdoc in University of Washington in David Baker's group, which some of you might have heard the name. Um, so we, we, the idea of the panel was to ask about how AI is changing scientific discovery. And um, <coughs> since each panelist, is your, your each of you is from a bit of a different field, we thought we'd start with kind of what do you define as the relevant field and what happened in the recent, where recent can be five years or two years or 20 years uh, in terms of AI, and then we'll talk about what are the implications. So that's the question. And you have a uh, mic. Can you hear me? So talk about what happened in the last First of all, define the, define the field first. Okay, so I am interested in the structural basis of proteins and how they communicate. And this field has had a really immense uh, advance in the last two or three years. It's like really, um, it's like a revolution. It's like a step function. It's like you've been wavering around like for a long time at a certain level, and it's like a step function that brought us to a completely new level. So there are many, many um, exciting new um, tools, new applications um, in the field of structural biology. Um, things that work, things that don't work, and it's like every day I discover new things. It's like an amazing uh, time to be there. A and these are AI tools? AI tools, yes. Yeah. So AI, I um, think the big st uh, step forward came with the AlphaFold program, which I guess you have heard about, uh, developed by DeepMind. DeepMind and the idea of the ability to predict a structure at atomic resolution that basically is very similar to what we get from experiments is a really, really new thing. We didn't think that this would happen. I didn't think it would happen. And there are many, many interesting questions that we can ask. First of all, there are many new applications. Um, there is now a model for approximately every protein that is known. So many approaches that have looked at the organization, the evolution, the functionality of proteins can now be done at a large scale. That's one thing. The other thing, we can identify with confidence which regions we can model, which regions we cannot model. And I think personally that things that we cannot model is also very interesting because we know that we cannot model them. The confidence level is low. And there are many, many different things that we can learn now about these regions that we haven't known before. Now, for, us, for a biologist that um, has no idea about structure prediction, these tools are now available, and uh, if before <coughs> we had to look for long times, if we wanted to look at structures, now these models are available, and the first thing that you see is that there are all these unstructured things around you that ne nobody has ever looked at them because of the, uh, of the difficulty to study them. And so biological applications have been um, uh, um, uh, immensely, um, have immensely profited from these uh, advances. Not only from structure prediction, because structure prediction basically takes a sequence and generates a structure. But if you take it the other way, you take a structure and you generate a sequence that fits that structure, this is protein design. And so protein design has had an immense um, advances in the last uh, in the last few months, actually, in the next last year. So there are, there are new tools like protein and PNN, uh, Rosetta Diffuse, it's called Rosetta Fold. Rosetta Fold. Rosetta Fold Diffuse, right? Diffusion, something. Rosetta fold is similar to alpha fold, but the other direction is like um, using this for design. So basically, Rosetta fold diffuse um, can generate many, many very good backbones, and then you can use this for very fast uh, design methods. 
And this is the first time, and yeah, this is the first time that you can actually generate by AI um, proteins that bind with very, very, very strong affinities to your target. So basically, um, I know now that the Baker Lab has already generated for each and every cytokine a nanomolar binder. So you can basically generate tools and um, drugs that are very, very fine tuned, very, very accurate, very, very precise. And then we can take the next one. It's a lot of really, really cool things. Um, so, right. So, um, so in our group, we're interested in many different questions related to uh, collective behavior in biological systems, usually going from the cellular level to the tissue or, or organism level, thinking about how cells communicate, how they um, behave together to form um, a collective phenomena on the level of uh, tissues like division of labor um, or information flow, how cells encode information. Um, and, and so forth. Uh, and these questions have been around for a while. And one of the main things that have changed in recent years, so in, in I think my, in my general field, it's uh, the time scale is a bit longer um, than a few months. I would say that one of the main revolutions were, um, uh, are ongoing in the past decade or so. It actually has to do with uh, data. So it's um, generated by uh, new types of technologies that allow us to get a lot more um, information, um, high throughput, high uh, large scale, about um, millions of cells and uh, information about the identity of each one of them, uh, which has, has not been uh, possible before. and. Now we have this um, uh, window into asking many new types of questions and asking the same questions we've been interested in, but from new perspectives, right? So we, um, um, there are many labs around the world that can now take um, a piece of uh, tissue or uh, whole organisms and basically ask um, what uh, what are the identities of, of different cells within them, right? So we now um, get this type of information for hundreds of thousands of cells. For each one, we have information about, for example, it's gene expression, so how tens of thousands of genes are expressed or what are their activity levels for each cell, which is a proxy for, their, uh, for the, this uh, cell's state or function. Um, and we can now ask new questions about how these cells actually, uh, what are the identities of the cells, what are their functions, how they collectively um, uh, form different types of behavior. And I think um, to answer or to approach all these questions, we just need new types of um, computational tools that would allow us to, to um, deal with this huge amounts of data and it also pushes us towards uh, new directions and new questions, and I think we'll get to that. And uh, yeah, in the next part of it. So I want to answer about three things that uh, I believe uh, have changed in three different ways. Uh, the first one follows what Oma and Hilmo said, um, but I'll go back ancient history. So I'll talk about science in general because the two things you described are the opportunity to make huge scientific discoveries with gene expression, with new proteins, design and so on. And, and I think that's a huge transformation we are going through these days. And I gave some quick promo earlier, but I want to, to give the, the full historical picture the way I see it is that there are five paradigms of how uh, scientific discovery have been made, five paradigms for different periods in time. So if we, if we go in ancient, ancient times, people were just making trial and error, right? Just trying and finding things. So if we think about molecules that were found, we can think about the oldest molecule that was found as therapeutic that we know people used. Do you know which one was that? The oldest uh, molecule that was used as a therapy? 
I think no, insulin is relatively new. I, w I would go to... What, what? <laughs> um, I think it's in this range of things. I believe it's opium poppy, so the morphine. <laughs> it, it remains of it uh, in all ancient tombs of, of uh, Egyptian, um, Egyptian leaders. Even I think the oldest one is in Israel that was found near Tel Aviv. There was a, an article in the newspaper a uh, couple of months ago that says that the oldest one was in Yehud, those who are from here know uh, where it is. So this is ancient time. People knew about molecules and therapy, but they just found out. Uh, they found a way to use it, like uh, the huge, the awful stories about uh, decapitated children in South America that had remains of morphine in their bodies. So people used it in all kinds of things. That's ancient time. That's the first paradigm of how science is being made. You just try. Then you jump all over to the 16th, 17th century to Sir Francis Bacon, who was talking about what a scientific discovery is. And he said that you have a very formal way to make a scientific discovery. You pose a question, and then the question is followed by a study, and you come up with an hypothesis, and then you test it. And after you tested it, you come up with a result that might be a discovery because you corroborated your hypothesis about new things. And this very formal way, is actually, I mean, we can think about how AI fits in and how causal inference uh, fits in. It might provide you by a very strong hypothesis. It's probably not the full alternative to an experiment, at least not today, that we don't know everything about the world, but it's a good way to accelerate the part of the question study and hypothesis. And if we go with the opium poppy example, then do you know who was the first to isolate the molecule from the, from the flower? Sertoner from um, the seventh, 17th century, so he was a pharmacist, 18 year old, very energetic, very ex uh, excited about using these and trying to, from the 50 different mole molecules, to find the one that is responsible for the effect. And the first e experiment he did, he had an hypothesis on the dose that you should use, that this is the right molecule, and it, there are different stories, but him and a, another kid and three uh, dogs, were obtained this dose and everybody almost died because <laughs> you know the real the real thing isolated it's a totally different quantity that you need to use. So what did he do? He was a scientist, so he experimented and he came up with more hypotheses. More hypotheses ended up an advoc an, an advocate against using it because he was uh, an addict at the end of all of these experiments. <laughs> so that was the second paradigm where you have a very clear process. The third paradigm is using uh, this very clear process with machinery. So that goes to the finding the endorphin that is the similar to the similar to the morphine, but in our uh, brain. And the endorphin, do you know how that was found? And I'm, I'm going to stop with this example and to uh, finish my <laughs> answer. But uh, that was also an, a nice story. This was like um, Casterlitz and Huge waking up early in the morning in Edovin, going to the market buying the brains of pigs that were just slaughtered. And they said, these pigs probably reacted to the awful um, experience they just uh, had. And they might have endorphin or what they were looking for, a molecule similar to morphine in their brain. So they were making a brain soup out of all of these uh, materials. And they were looking with all the stock, the x-ray, all the machinery that they had. This is like the 70s. <laughs> uh, I think it was 1973 when they found the endorphin, which is a molecule similar to the morphine in our brain. So this was a scientific discovery that not only leverages the process, but it also leverages advanced technology. And then came in the, 19, in, in the beginning of this century, AI, and became very important. So that's the false paradigm. But then comes what you, you two just said, which is extraordinarily successful AI using huge data sets, using uh, hybrid computing, so you are not relying only on the computers you established in your environment, but you benefit from all of these advanced technologies. And that's accelerated discovery and the new way to make science in 2020 plus. So I think it's a transition of, of these years. And, and that's, so as, as a citizen in the world of scientists, I see that AI is changing significantly. And I pose as a question that we might address in the last panel, whether quantum computing going to be also a strong thing within it. I don't know, I don't know. But I do know, and I do see that AI 
changes the way we do science. And specifically, and the, se <coughs> the second and the third points I wanted to make, I'll do much shorter. The second point is that um, AI has changed in the way we are working. I think I really like the paper from Stanford from 2020 when they talked about foundation models. And they just frame it nicely. They said that machine learning in the past was, there were many different methods. Like I came back from Berkeley, I had my own computer and knew how to run SVM, decision support, Andrew Forest, everything. F few hundred examples, thousands of examples, few hundred parameters, and you're done. Then came deep learning, and it became evident that deep learning outperforms all of the other tasks, uh, the ta in, in all tasks, other, uh, all the other algorithms. So the question became, what architecture? And it wasn't about which model and which method to use. And then it's tens of thousands, and it's this size of, of data and parameters. But then came foundation models, where you pre-train like AlphaFold is like a foundation model. It's not formally a foundation model, but it's very similar approach with transfer learning. But it's huge um, deep learning model with attention part into <coughs> it is the ability to learn a representation and to fine tune based on your own data. And that's a new paradigm in AI that has its own pros and cons. It's no longer an effort that you can do on your computers. It's millions and billions of different data sets, right? And it's no longer something that you can do within a very small group. So it's a question to ask the, the AI community, are we going to share all our pre-trained models, some have, were shared, some were not, some were shared but were not clean and trusted, so you, you don't know what you're using. So that's the second point. Foundation models is a big change, and I think it influences everything we do. And the third point, I will just bring it through a, a small story. I'm a strong believer that the medical community should benefit from AI in different ways, but one of the things we need to do in order for them to benefit is to connect the physicians to our efforts. And I'm uh, in the managing board of the Israeli Society for Health Tech, and I'm, I have, I'm teaching in courses for expert physicians who want to have subspecialty in these areas of AI and, and technology. And I keep asking the team questions like, what was the best AI you've seen uh, recently? And the answers I get are so frustrating. It's like a surgeon tells me, I saw it when I made the surgery and I had this app that helps me select the best music to listen to. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's the best AI he saw in practice because indeed there's a huge gap between what can be done and is um, uh, op happening in the wider community that uh, benefits from AI and what's happening in the medical world. And there are multiple reasons for it and that's maybe a different question. Yeah. I, I'll try to focus on this scientific discovery. And so I think the question, I'll try to summarize the answers to the first question. Ora said there's AlphaFold and all its relative and they're chain they opened up a whole new set of questions. Moore said there's a lot of new data but we are not sure where the AI, we clearly need it but we are not sure what it is. Uh, that's I'm paraphrasing. And, and Michal talked about the general picture about the progress of AI, although to Michal I would ask, you know, can you give an example where, for example, foundational model, aside from creating fun pictures and, and story things, actually helped in the scientific discovery process, if you're thinking about, you, you mentioned the, the formal scientific process. I am really curious about you know, can we pinpoint where it actually helped? Or I'm, I'm sure that everybody has been using different tools in labs and when doing research about things, but where exactly the, t the tools from AI really change the, the perspective, the ability? And I'm happy to answer. I have a lot of examples, but I don't want to take all the time. I want you guys to start and I, then I can <laughs> make sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, I can give some examples, but if so you I have your own. I can say something. Maybe I can say something general yeah. to set the stage for you yeah. to answer <laughs> more specifically. I'll, I'll say that um, you know, towards this, this panel, I've been thinking a lot about um, different ways in which AI is used for scientific discoveries in many different areas. And I think you know, I have a lot of things to say about that, but I think one of the 
distinctions that I think is interesting to make is between three cases in basic, at least in, in, in basic science. Or so the first one is where um, the question is well defined. Okay? And, and we know what we're asking, we have a pretty clear idea of how to test if we succeeded or not, when we try to answer it. So the protein design is an example? Yeah, and from my perspective, I don't know if Aura would agree with that. The protein the design. The, not the design, sorry, right, the, the structure of prediction, yeah. right? So we have the sequence, the goal is to predict how the protein would look, looks in 3D. Of course, it's more subtle than that because it changes, it's not always constant when it finds, but, but in general, it's, it's a well-defined question. And there is just, um, we just needed better computational tools to answer it. Okay, just, in, okay, uh, with, with uh, big quotes around it. So that's like one type of, of things where, where AI can help us. And, and then another type um, would be to ask whether we can actually learn something from the model back about nature, back about biology, back about, um, but yeah, so, so um, and I think, and I think there are some, some interesting examples for that, um, mainly I've seen it uh, from uh, neuroscience research, where uh, people try to analyze the, um, what the model has learned and show that there are some interesting analogies to to modular um, activities patterns in the brain. And for example, when you try to teach a network how to navigate, you can see the emergence of some things we've seen. In, okay. So these, and there are many examples like that. And, and this is, and it's a different type of use of this new engine, right? And then a third very exciting thing in my, in my view for thinking about AI for scientific discoveries, is actually incorporating the AI in the whole process itself, informing the questions to begin with, and in, tr and in trying to think how, how do we form the hypothesis, what type of questions can we ask, and how can we um, bring in these new abilities into being able to formulate um, our perception of the world in a better way, and not just use it for, again, I, I'm using the word, word just, of course, it's you know, huge, very important fields, but still it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting aspect that I think is um, underrepresented. Uh, uh, so, uh, just to be kind of provocative, I don't yeah. know how many people remember the robot scientists that people built this robot that could do um, basic biochemical experiments on enzymes and and, and so they designed the robot and they designed an AI system that did some search to decide what experiment to do next and there was a paper in science and a big, uh, a very big uh, PR for some university. Oh, this was like 15, 16 years ago. And, but, but that was clearly a, 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 a more of a PR stunt than really changing the way we, we, we do this science. So, so where, where exactly you know, you, 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 how do you foresee the, the, the co-pilot of AI helping you to make better hypotheses? So I'll give, I'll give an example. Okay. Um, so, and my example is based on many times on how physicists think about the world. Okay. Nobody is perfect. Yes. <laughs> so, um, maybe a caricature, ca caricature of one type of physicist would be someone who looks you know, go out, goes out of the lab, looks at some interesting uh, phenomenon in nature, um, and then the, the 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 goal is trying to understand or trying to explain the mechanism behind it or, or what's going on. And one of the the most important tools that we have as scientists, I think, is and that help us a lot is our ability to connect new types of systems that we don't understand to systems that we understand well, right? And physicists do it all the time, and scientists are not physicists as well. And there are, for example, in physics, there are several um, 
you know, I, I want to say foundation models. Of course, it's it's um, it's a different meaning, but several basic models that we understand very well and have been studied for many years. And um, you know, for better or for worse, this is our like, uh, hypothesis class in the sense that 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 every m many types of new phenomena that we see in nature. Our uh, maybe our uh, you know instinct is trying to connect it to one of the things that we understand well, and then maybe you will have some tweaks or or not. Um, but um, and, and I think we do you know as scientists we do it all the time, right? And and for example, thinking about an example from biology, we look at, at huge regulatory networks for many different organisms, right? We we're trying to understand different patterns. We can look at okay, we see an new circuit, what does it do, does it look similar to something else we've seen somewhere else, trying to understand. Um, so I think that it's, um, it really makes sense to bring AI or some type of new computational models into this loop, trying to help us to form these connections and analogies in an earlier step than what is usually being done. Um, and. Um, I think maybe I'll also try. That is very similar to what I wanted to say in another, um, in, from another uh, point of view. I think um, it's very interesting to see um, the difference to compare different uh, models. So with AI, you can basically, I think one of the insights I had is um, I talked to a crystallographer and we were talking about this AI that you have like you have the sequence, you have the structure, and it, it appeared to me when the crystallographer puts his protein into these solutions to get the crystal, it's basically very similar. He doesn't really understand what's going on. He gets the crystal and it solves the structure. And for me, it's really important to understand why this sequence falls into that structure. I want to understand the physical underlying basis of why that happens, because I think it's a formidable problem. It's a formidable. It's really a wonder how this works and why do you need these 20 amino acids? All these questions that you can ask if you understand the basic physics of it. So. I was very reluctant about AI because AI basically gives you the end point, but it does not explain to you what happens inside. Well, that's and the second point more broad that we learned from the... Exactly. And then the, so, so what I can say is, so the idea is that with AI you can get all these mappings, right, from one point to the other, and then you can then go back, backtracking, and you can both try to look at what AI actually did. Because, for example, the ESM fault from Facebook, from Meta AI, when they did the ESM4, they basically they had this natural language processing that basically generated embeddings for protein sequences. And when they looked at what what this what these embeddings represent, they could actually see that the structure is an emerging feature of these embeddings. So basically, you get this out of your learning. So that's one thing. But the other thing that I think is really important is when we looked uh, like uh, ten years ago or so, when the first designs came out, the first de novo designs, where you took a structure, you um, had your basic um, knowledge-based um, energy model, and you basically tried to find the sequence that gets the best um, energy for a certain fault. And the first time this happens, that was in top seven, that was in 2003, that structure was like super stable, and super, like really, really, really stable. So basically this showed that we had pushed forward the development of these knowledge-based, uh, statistic-based functions that only looked for stability, and you got this full stability, you didn't get any function, any, any evolution in noise algebra. So I think, w and, and this comes back now, again, now with AlphaFold and with, with, with all these other um, protocols, with most of them, you need a multiple sequence alignment to get this information, but you don't need it when you do the designs. And so I think what I am very excited about is that this AI allows you to, together with other models, to basically um, you know, home in from two directions in the complexity. What is the, what is the transition between something that is biophysics and something that is actually a complexity in the living system? I think the way we can do this today, we can actually really much better define what we understand, but we don't understand between this transition that suddenly you get some complexity and you get, see what I mean? I, I, I think, but uh, they, okay, so I'll, in, Michal, I'll blame you for bringing history here into the mix. So, uh, chemists have organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry because they believe there were two different rules for things that come from the life life organism, things that come from the from 
the nature that is not alive and, and there was a big breakthrough about this understanding that life that living system is actually built from the same chemical rules as everything else but and and it seems like and and the mystery was how you get life out of you know carbon and oxygen and and the same things that you know get quartz out of or things like that and and what you just said is that Okay, we replace that mystery by a big network that we don't understand that does the job. So we, instead of the, the reductionist approach that we'll understand the nuts and bolts and then how to build from them bigger and bigger component, you're saying we can now predict the whole protein or the whole system behavior, but we actually don't understand what, what, where is the miracle hiding? Yeah, but I'm saying we, do, we shouldn't stop there. We shouldn't stop there. This is exactly the opportunity to actually to bring our basic models further. That's yeah, but, but is, it, is it going to be, you know, pe people playing with whatever, AlphaGo foundation model until we, we, we think we found the rule and then is this, is this real science or is this just playing around with network and finding patterns that we might not hold to the future, you know, that we cannot test either because Michal is eager to... Yeah. <laughs> to I'm, happy to <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to share my view on that because I think it, it aligns with well the way you framed it and also over the way you, you discussed it. I totally agree that there is um, AI when you apply, when you have ground truth, you know how to test it, it's well defined, and then um, AI can find you things that you didn't think about and you might trust it and we can talk about explainability in a minute. And that's one way to discover. And I can give a concrete real example from the past months. We have as an extended team a collaboration with uh, Professor Kim Chen uh, from Cleveland Clinic on anti-cancer anti autoimmune therapy. And the team is using AI technologies in order to analyze binding affinity between the, um, the antibodies and the they analyze it, so these are two proteins, uh, even more that needs to connect between them, and they analyze the likelihood of affinity as well as the strength of the affinity, and they created a model that is trusted by these scientists, and now after they created the model, they found that there are more interactions uh, between certain proteins than what they expected, and these are the proteins mis with mutations that they can infer something about this protein. So they learned some realization, scientific realization, about the way the autoimmune therapy uh, affects our body through uh, reasoning on what they learned from the AI. And they couldn't do it before because they didn't have the chance to know how the protein interacts because this in silico testing can be performed only when you have very strong technology. So I think what we see here are two steps. First, you need to create a trusted enough AI so that you can trust its results. And then you reason about what you learn that you may, like what you want, the, the person who does the x-ray for you to interpret why the structure is like that. Probably it's you that would have to, to do this inference, but maybe AI would replace that other role of finding the structure, and then you do this reasoning, so you now know more about the world, and you can reason more. So I think this is one bucket. A different bucket that more you talked about as well is is the creativity bucket, like Dali and uh, and all the these other methods that offer the um, artists ways to create new things. Potentially, experts in protein design. It's not only about the folding, it's about all the interaction and new protein that you want to create would get from a technology ideas of what other proteins might be that are therapeutic. And that would be a list of candidates in a creative way, a list of new candidates. You never saw these proteins. And now you start to reason, um, reason about them and say, is this so something of value that they can learn from? It can inspire me or not? So that's more the creative part. So I think both of these parts would be become part of science and are becoming part of science today. And I have very few examples, like there's an example of, a, again, a team of uh, IBM research team who's working on finding new small molecules and looked at the spark uh, 
uh, of this fat protein of COVID and was generating small, new small molecules. But they are all new candidates, right? <coughs> this is very initial. It's like the very creative thought of what can be the new molecule. And from there, there's a lot of work over there. So, so I'm trying to organize this discussion into something. So the, all the examples you gave are wonderful. And essentially, they are saying we can replace a, a model of nature, of physics, or folding, and so on, by something that generalized from a lot of data we had. And we can then use it in mass to generate, for example, how <coughs> all the mutations might affect the binding, who can bind whom, you know, which small <coughs> molecule can bind spike, and all of those things. And and I think that's that's a class that raises the question of, you know, when when do we come back and say we we actually have to do an experiment and not just do in silico experiments. And, and Aura mentioned that AlphaFold is able to tell which models are not are low confidence. Um, we clearly haven't got to the stage where we can actually test all the predictions of AlphaFold, and maybe we should, we don't need to, but, but, but people are talking today about systems that are not as well understood as I think protein folding. For example, people predicting the genetic interac uh, uh, perturbation to cells, which is, I'm not, trying to discount protein folding, but it's a, it's a much more complex system in terms of the, the number of vari variables that go into it. Um, and, and the kind of question I ask, ask myself is, when do we start believing those, except for you know trusting it the way humans do, we see it keeps being correct, so we start believing it. But how do we get to a point where we actually believe that it does it from the right perspective? I also think it's a question, I think we need to, we need more time to understand what we really can do and do what is wrong. Because it's like with these Dali pictures and you get in, in immediately at them. At this but with Dali I can look at it and say, oh, this is, makes sense or this is crazy. And it's but there is still always something missing, right? Yeah. Maybe there is something missing. And there is also this hype that basically could be, you know, that there are things that we are just really, really missing. That's why I'm saying we should focus also on the things that we clearly don't get right. We can actually identify them, then we can also advance in that direction. Because not everything is going to be right. It's what you put in, you will get out. And if, not, if we are not putting enough things in, we won't get enough out. So for example, in the structure prediction field, it's clear. The, the structures that went in to alpha fold are crystal structures. So now we can predict crystal structures, but we can't predict anything that, you know, all the binding, of, uh, binding uh, events that happen where the two proteins are not stable, they keep ento uh, conformation entropy. We can't, pro we can't use these models for this. And this is now starting, but I think the point here is that the fact that this is now starting with the dynamics that effect is, um, effort is putting into starting dynamics, is the, the reason for this is that we now understand what we can do. We understand what we cannot do. I think that's, again, that these steps. Uh, I, I'm noticing that the time is flying, so I'll, I'll try to move on a bit with the, the planned trajectory of this panel, which we departed from a long time ago. Um, looking forward, how AI is going to... So we talked about what's happened, what happened recently in the field, and, and Michal also talked a bit about the future, but what does the future hold in terms of, of how we will use AI in, in your you're not necessarily all of the science, but things that uh, each one is feeling comfortable talking about. And where is the scientist, um, what's the role of the scientist? And the scientist is now, uh, I'm, I'm again, it's a cr it's a cr I'm taking it to the extreme, but are we just now uh, shepherds of models and we have to feed them and look what they bring out? Or, or we are, we are doing something more, more smarter and, and more creative about the questions we're, we're, we're doing. Can't do or more. You actually didn't Close hold the mic for a while. Close so, to, to the mic. Um, so, uh, okay. So obviously, the way that you phrase the question, you know, um, the answer is is to be clear. But I think. I think it's a very interesting time. I think there are things that are very natural to answer with such, with you know AI, whatever it means in different fields. And I think in, in um, when you look, for example, at 
all the things that you can do with single cell analysis. It's clear that the field is moving. It has these waves that are really driven by what um, the newest computational models can do well. And it has its advantages, right? Because it, it pushes the field forward um, and it brings new people in and people can do, you know, answer a specific tasks in, in much faster rate and then, you know, go on to new questions. But it also um, shapes and constrains the field in any ways I feel like that. So, so you know, maybe in, in different times there are different forces that do that, but, but personally, and I think it's a matter of personal taste or personal scientific taste, I think that many times um, it's important to, and now it's going to sound, you know, too much, but, but, um, but pause and, and, and go back to the, to, the, to the basic questions and what we're really interested in answering that may not be the, um, the thing that is clearest to, you know, that, that is easiest to answer with the new computational models and then try to form new types of questions and try to understand what type of um, models or frameworks we need to develop to answer them. So there are, you know, so there are advantages and disadvantages to these. That's great. I, I'm happy to add because I fully agree with you and I, I, I'm going to take it back to the medical world rather than the pharma and, and drugs and molecules. So in the medical world, um, you see that foundation models I saw were applied on medical data, like there's a paper called BERT, B-E-R-H-T, BERT with an H, I call it. So the BERT with an H, uh, it's a transformer that was trained on large uh, patients' data from, a medic from medical centers and <coughs> then predicted the next visit and predicted all kinds of uh, these activities. And I'm teaching a course for physicians and so, a group of close to 20 physicians were reading the, the paper, very impressed by the bell transformer. I gave them the whole story, the whole spiel about foundation models and how appealing it is and what it makes and so on. But then they said, we didn't learn anything from the application of the tool or the data, and we don't see the value in this context. So, okay, it's easier to predict next visit if it's about hypertensive patients, because this condition is linked to diabetes and cardiac and many other things, so it's easy to predict the next diagnosis would be hypertension versus to predict next diagnosis would be uh, losing uh, hearing uh, capaci capacity that's less predictable. What did we learn from that? Nothing. But it's a nice exercise, well published. So there are these uh, type of things where people tend to use the, uh, the state-of-the-art hyper algorithms but forget what you said more about, okay, but where do we come from? Why are we doing that? What can, how can we leverage that? So I think that in the medical world, in the context of using patient's data, uh, this, uh, this is really tricky, to, to use the technology in a way that would change the field, that would leverage what we knew, it's really complex. I believe that today's presentation were extremely important. I mean, causal inference and the ability to infer causal relations is a key to, to come up with novel scientific finding from the data. Because just prediction repeats, repeats what you have in the data. So I think this is one direction where we are heading, applying causal, making it more consumable, more uh, easy to apply, testable. That's why Michael was sharing all the tools we are creating, because it's so important to be able to evaluate it. It's not a standard paradigm. It's a much more complex paradigm. So that's one direction. The other direction that I showed in that session is the explainability part, where we see clearly that people are interested in explainability because of all the reasons you said, and I think, I don't know how many of you heard about the example of, that was posted in BBC in 2015 about a boyfriend putting his girlfriend picture and said Google mapped it into a chimpanzee, did you see that? <laughs> so the, Google had this app where you can automatically label images. So on your phone, you can take this app and you automatically label all the images. And he showed 
my girlfriend was labeled as a chimpanzee. And when you think about what happened there, it's probably easy to understand because the data was highly biased. It was certain people with certain color uh, trained as human, and this uh, African-American uh, girlfriend didn't have the typical uh, features of what was trained for, for faces of people, as opposed maybe to other things. So the bottom line is that what I just did, I explained you the algorithm, right? I didn't really explain you the algorithm. I give you an angle on the algorithm that helps you understand its limitation. It's not a real explanation of the algorithm. That's a post hoc analysis of the limitations and the trustworthiness of the algorithm. And you could have learned about it if you do all kinds of interrogations, like what would change the uh, label of the algorithm by slightly changing features in the uh, data that you offer. That would give you understanding, but you don't understand the algorithm yet. So I believe this type of post hoc analysis explainable algorithm would become part of everything we want to trust. And in medical, you need to trust in the medical world when you apply AI. So two directions I see. The first one that I mentioned, and the second one, which is explainability that follows the AI. It doesn't have to be inherent to the how the algorithm works, but must be a way to interrogate um, explainability and cause them to identify new things. I totally agree. I think in, in our field, I think the one of the most uh, clear uh, effects will be drugs. I mean, there will be so many more drugs. I mean, the vaccine, there is now a vaccine against COVID that was designed. Not to, not to say, yeah, but it's a designed vaccine and it's working very well. Korea is vaccinated by this vaccine. And so drugs is going to be a very big part. And I think it just will help us to go to the next level of complexity if we build it this way. Um, <coughs> It will change uh, the way I, I see it like in terms of history. When I, when I remember when I was in the Baker Lab, it was just when Top 7 was, um, was published. And there were people in the audience that, that were claiming that the Rosetta force field is crap because we don't understand what they're doing because it's knowledge based. <coughs> so it's basically based on statistics of proteins. And so, um, and now when I hear, and, and then David would say it's, it's maybe, maybe knowledge based, but it's, it, captures physical features better than the than, you know, charm also, because the hydrogen bonds have an angle because you have to look at the orbitals and so on. And so, and now like last year or so, I hear David talking about our energy field, force field, that is a biophysical force field, because AI is the next step. So I think it's like history. I guess next next step will be again, like we are, we are moving again one step higher, and there will be next levels of complexity that we can now explore. And we will slowly but surely take what we now think as the next level, like as the baseline, and then we will proceed. I think that's the way I see it, how it's going to go. We can answer much more interesting questions, but we need to be careful about what the underlying things are. So, so the message I'm hearing is use AI as top bottom-up tool to kind of make complicated tasks easier, and then you can... To learn. To learn and to do other tasks, like you mentioned. Yes. Yes. But well but to learn. That, that's what that what I think is like this inference model too. Yeah. Questions from the audience. Uh, we've been talking among ourselves. I, I don't know how entertaining we were or not. Um, yeah. Oh. Questions. Yeah. How come we are so bad at prediction? I mean, uh, yeah. We as as humans. Okay, so, uh, so since you're sitting up front, I'll just summarize the question for people in the back. Why AI researchers, not just the four of us, but as a collective, are making predictions that are wrong in both directions? One's predictions that are sort of super optimistic about we don't need expert radiologists in the future because they should have been replaced 
before, and the other is that nobody predicted that AlphaGo will work <coughs> when it works. Anybody has comments on those? I, I have a very short answer. It's because we don't have good causal analysis. This is intervention, <laughs> right? <laughs> AI is an intervention in the world, and you, you never saw this intervention before. So what can you learn from? So that's like just a immediate answer. Well, you I might have a more in-depth I want to say something that is related and not related. I think the last couple of years have shown us that we know how to design vaccines, but we don't know how to convince people to take them. So I think that's a little bit part of the answer, but not, not the full answer. So I, I think the answer is that human psychology is is that we tend to overestimate some, you know, we, we're not good at estimating the complexity of a problem, and. Jeff Hinton, which has a lot of respect, doesn't really understand what our geologists <laughs> are doing. Um, and and by the way, it's a very f hard field to convince young physician to go uh, be go into specialization because they keep hearing that the AI will replace them. So why go into a dying profession? Um, and on the other hand, there are things that machines can do surprisingly well that we underestimate that we think are much harder than they are. So I, I, this is a question more about the, the natural AI rather than the artificial, the natural intelligence rather than the artificial intelligence, I guess. But I don't know if it's a, I guess that was what Aura was trying to say in a different way. Yes. That was very eloquent. <laughs> I, would say, I have been thinking about this sentence that I saw when I was a PhD student. There was this chemistry professor, and he had on his uh, on his door he had this uh, saying: uh, "If the brains were so simple that we could understand them, we would be so simple. We would be so simple we couldn't." And I keep thinking: if this is true, or if you know how this relates to what we're doing right now. So how how would you define first principles? I mean, you 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 decide you said that we don't understand protein folding from first principles because we just run an AI on a lot of data, but. Michal wants to answer, but I'll just. Yeah. So here is an example of a situation that I think is solved for first principle, but maybe I'm totally uninformed. But people predict the weather rather well, and there it's not we took a lot of data and put it to the network, but we have kind of understanding how pieces of atmosphere move, and we just have a, the compute power to apply it on a very big scale of multiple 
pieces like that and how they interact and so on. So that's actually an example of a very complicated system that I think we can say we, we, we predict, therefore we understand, but based on, on, we can explain to somebody how the weather prediction kind of works, um, which is not the same way we can explain how AlphaFold predicts. When? I'm trying to, because at least in the, in the weather it's, it's basic rules, very simple rules of physics that are actually going into the simulation. Yeah, but they are lying to you, right? It's okay. like to say, <laughs> it's like to say that Newton rules explain the ball that you throw. It's not a real story because there's friction and everything yeah. happening there and so on. <coughs> Same in the simulations that you do with the uh, climate story, which I believe there are a lot of also AI algorithms playing a role today, but never mind. Let's say it's only simulation. You have you put some simple rules, but they lead to a very complex system, and yeah. you don't really grasp the complex system. You have some notion in your mind on, oh, it came from this original interaction. Uh, the example was supposed to show that simple rules can generate very complex systems, and 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 and, and I think Lucas was saying that this is not exactly what we have in some of the examples we talked about here. That's I th I th if I take the gist. That we didn't find the simple rules that would explain these systems of representation of large language models. That's, yeah. I think we can also go back to the explanation of the attention and what depends on what, and that would be the simple rules that, yes, you have to engineer. Also, I, if I take again the example of the, of the climate, if you do it for real, you need to configure a lot of parameters. Nobody, it's a black magic as well. You don't know the parameters you need to configure in order to match between the, these simple rules into the, real, the reality you see. So I think that uh, at certain level, there is understanding of these foundation models. It's not, it's not a, a rabbit out of this uh, head that just went out. It has some principles, but uh, if you want to, I mean, I, I have something to say also about the being uh, the hubris versus being hum humble, I think that um, there are changes that I see in the field of in science and in medicine that are two different trends. In the science, it would be from the very basic um, set of rules to understand the notion that I agree with you near that simple things might lead to very complex. Uh, uh, interactions that we will not be able to track, and maybe I don't recall uh, who is the team. I think it was DeepMind that did uh, a year ago, two years ago. They were very close to the um, to the zero Kelvin temperature, and they show what happened to a certain material by using AI that explains. I mean, those very um, unstable situation. Do you remember the example of DeepMind where they analyzed this? Uh, cloud of material at a very, very close to the zero temperature. And they did this mixture. They used AI to predict some of the conditions of the material as well as some physics. And that, that's led to something. I think that science scientists today understand that to do good science, they need to leverage these tools and they need to understand how they work, but not at every level. And the equivalent to me, it's large language models. We need to understand that there is a tension, we need to understand how dependencies were designed and so on, but it doesn't mean that I know why it should have 17 layers and not 15, I mean that, so that's a change I do see and, and I have a small story about that too, is that like, like when I did a PhD in physics and then I moved to AI and joined a lot of the AI community, community in the world and then I was invited to a deep learning school in Japan it was like around seven years ago, and it was an invitation from my friends in, f in the physics world. Everybody all of a sudden understood that deep learning on their data would be meaningful. The funny story is that when I got there, it's like only 30 people, it's smaller than this event, and everybody, I mean al almost everybody, flew a very long way in order to get to the school, so I came there and I saw one friend, another friend, another friend. We were talking and then we were sitting, and Professor Pierre Balti, who leads the session, says, I welcome all of you today, and I especially welcome Michal. And I was like, what did I do? <laughs> For agreeing to be the only woman in the audience. <laughs> and I didn't notice, that we, because all of them were physicists to me, it was my colleagues. So that was that school, everybody did the planning, all of a sudden. 
And I think now with foundation models, we see, and the example that I gave from DeepMind that I don't recall this, the whole set of details, but it's an amazing physics breakthrough that made its way to, uh, to uh, one of the best journals, is the same story, understanding that uh, the world goes down that path. I think in the medical world, there is a change that is different if in the physician world, a, a change that is different in flavor and nature. So if you think about, and maybe that goes back to your question about what will happen in medicine, I think I see a very clear trend, so it's not a prediction because it's step by step, baby steps, I see it evolving and happening. And, and that's if you think about, I'll, I'll take it for rabbis in, in, Ju in Judaism. Rabbis 50 years ago, 70 years ago were admired and highly appreciated for having wonderful memory. And when you ask them a question, they tell you, it's written in the Talmud, in this page, in this place, in this line, you would find the answer. And that was very highly appreciated. And similarly, physicians were highly appreciated for being able to uh, provide answers from their memory on very complex uh, and atypical situations. This is no longer the case, not with rabbis and not with in medicine. You can immediately Google it and you can immediately find, find it, right? Uh, should I bring a rabbi to <laughs> wear on the... <laughs> I think the I rabbi... Have one in the you have one? I also have one ready for to help us. But I think in, in, in Judaism you see that often, it's not always the case, but often rabbis are hi highly appreciated for their ability to convey the information that they capture. So it's not only about knowledge, it's also about the interaction. And in physicians, I, I talked with a number of people who lead medical schools, you see that you no longer, it's not that you need to have the highest score and you just get for your intelligence. It's also the ability to communicate. And you do interviews in Israel, you see it very clearly that the world has shifted and it's not the highest scores only. You have to go through an interview and to be able to make it. And it's to be able to communicate with the team of workers that support the patient. Would it be the social social worker and the, and the nurse and the family member who is uh, helping. You need to be able to, co uh, to convey the, the information. It's not only to be able to, to have it in your brain. So I see that shift and it has to do with uh, being more humble as well, I think. So. Do you agree? <laughs> A question. Uh, 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 Sidestepping que your question. <laughs> 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 Just to summarize the question is, you're asking the question of, I was trying to ask before, is has changed, has, has the way we do science changed so much because of AI? And specifically ask about going top <coughs> down rather than bottom up. I, I will let the, the panelists answer that. But, but, it's but um, I think many of us do both bottom up and top down and just, um, I think the classical example is brain science. I actually like Aura's quote. On, on, um, people try to solve brain science by understanding neurons, and other people try to solve brain science by understanding how we make decisions and, and then reasoning what's going on. And, and we are, s I don't know if it's progress or not, but I think there is a lot of progress on connecting those two very far ends of, of, of the spectrum. So. But I'm not sure that was your question, so maybe not. So I'll just say that there are many groups now that um, 
do take this approach, right? So, so trying to um, construct models that simulate reality as best as possible and then interrogate the models themselves, right? So you can do that, and many times, you know, you can think about it just as a way to push forward beyond what you can practically do experimentally, right? You just cannot do that many experiments. And there are many names for that, going from um, uh, digital twins and seem to real and right trying to f to to train a system to be as similar as possible to reality, so that now you can target it. And as I'm answering, I actually I'm not sure it's going in the direction <laughs> uh, which you meant, um, but. Um, I think these are very interesting directions. I think for some of them, it feels like we're missing <coughs> something, but it's fine. Like that's the way that you know science progresses. Um, and I, I think it goes back to one of, one of the also first things that I said about being able to, if you have a good enough model and you and and. It's like a way to think about science, to, to interrogate the model and try to understand something back about reality. And of course, you need to be careful, right? Because, right, because you already departed from reality, so you need to constrain it in enough ways. And going back to the other question, there are very interesting ways to um, constrain your models by, uh, for example, physical rules or you know, the whole field of physics informed machine learning or similar things where you're saying we're, we have these very powerful tools, but we're only going to let them learn, if I'm taking it to extreme, this can be relaxed, but one way to think about it is that we, we're only gonna let them learn rules that are consistent with what we already know about nature and how nature behaves, right? Or that are consistent with subsystems that we care about. And that lets us um, now be more confident about the results that we see and going back to <coughs> think about it and talk about way. Um, I want to give a little bit different answer. I've been thinking, I, I read, I think last week, an article <coughs> about the differences of how we scientists like to approximate a problem and how it actually happens in the real world. And I'm talking about, like, if we think about the problem as a landscape that we have to go through. So the landscapes that we develop in science are smooth landscapes, so it's easy to find an optimum, it's easy to navigate. And the actual landscapes that a protein goes through, I mean, I'm, uh, this is the uh, example that I can bring, but it's only one example. It's a much more rough uh, landscape, um, dominated by random motions, um, the scale problem. So basically, we are trying to simplify things so we are able to understand them. It's like we like symmetry because it's easier to understand the system if it's symmetric. And the question is, you know, where do these uh, approximations that we use both when we do deep learning and we, when we build uh, fundamental models, where do these approximations make sense and help us? And where do they, where do we miss something? When is it important to, to look at the details and when is it not important? And um, that's one thing. And the other thing is, how do we actually formulate our view as a multi-scale problem? I think one of the big um, challenges is that is to connect people or different scientists that study at different levels. Everyone likes to talk to the people that study at the same level, but you know the ones that study make more s more small. I like to say organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, or I don't know, um, like uh, systems biology on the cells as or systems biology <coughs> on molecules. There are many things that need to be integrated, and this is, I think, not done enough at all. So I think that's where we need to... I, I fully agree. I'm connecting to last point. I, I want to react on the bottom-up first uh, versus top-down, and, and, and to go back to my suggestion to think about AI as a key in, in scientific discovery in two different ways. One is that you have a very trusty AI technology in some context, and then you use it in order to learn things you didn't know, and then you reason about it and you make a discovery. 
The other one is the more creative way that you play with AI that generate all kinds of candidates and you uh, explore with them and you try to fix one thing and, to, and you learn through that. So I think the first one is the one that has to do with all these benchmarks and all the... If you want to have a very trusty AI, you want to have a benchmark and to attract people to do it. And when I think about, uh, and, and now I'm going to say something societal philosophic, I mean a bit like view, higher, le higher level view, if you think about uh, Sir Isaac Newton sitting in his, uh, in his farm and in the house and just thinking about the world and then the apple falls and he thinks about uh, uh, gravity, it's very unlikely it will happen today, right? Because our, us, people today, we don't sit bored somewhere and start to think on very <laughs> generic <laughs> questions. And we like to play. And I think that benchmarks are a game, and they attract the mind of many, many different people. So designing the right benchmark, meaning creating the right game for young scientists and software developers and data scientists, would attract the right attention to bring you the building box that the scientist would use later. And to, to give very concrete example, I, th I see it as a tool to create a benchmark. So if I think about the opportunities AI can bring to understand cancer prognosis and cancer therapeutic, I think it's endless. I mean, it's about what you said, Oma, there's pathology and genomic and imaging and clinical data, and all of that plays a role in how cancer evolves. But each group likes to talk to their, own, to their similar people. So you don't have a higher level view of who are the people for whom a therapy would be effective, who would not be effective, how prognosis is likely to happen. You cannot reason about it because it's so separated and segregated from different molecular view to higher level view. But the AI potentially can do it because AI is not limited to talking to this or that, but you need to get all the data. But if we want to see if we can get down that path, you can start create benchmarks on data that you have. And we connected with Cleveland Clinic and other partners and created a, a challenge on looking at imaging <coughs> clinical history to find whether renal cancer would evolve in this way or that way on specific data. So it's a benchmark and people can show little, uh, that they outperform others. This would provide us a tool, one tool out of many tools that we would need to trust and to benefit from in order to later reason on and come up with new science. So I don't know if it's bottom up or top down. Maybe bottom up you design the, the benchmarks, top down people are attracted to the benchmarks and contribute to the benchmarks. Okay, uh, since we're formally out of time, uh, and Michal gave us a, a sweeping uh, view any last sentence from the other two panelists? You can use the mic. <laughs> no pressure, but you can use the mic. <laughs> <laughs> can I say something unrelated to <laughs> what you said? Okay. Very, very short. But just the thought. The so I think talking in general about interpretability and how far we can take it and how it affects the way that we do science and so forth. Um, it's a little philosophical, but we've been spoiled by the fact that so much of just natural phenomena can be explained by very simple equations, right? You can imagine a different scenario where it wouldn't be the case, and then science would have a much harder time to progress without the, any computational tools like it has been. But we, we've been spoiled and we've got used to the idea that we should expect simple equations, simple models. Um, and then, you know, when we think about explainability, there is also the question of the threshold, right? Like what, at what point can you say, okay, if you have huge model, you know, billions of parameters, okay, that's, and you can't say anything about it, it's clearly too much to be able to grasp. <coughs> if you have a simple equation with you know, two terms, depending on terms, maybe you can say that you can explain what's going on, but it's not clear, right? There is not a clear threshold where you can say, this is too complicated, this is not simple enough. And um, it's, just, uh, it's just a point, I, I don't have the answer. But I think one of the things is that we maybe we should think about is 
what do we actually mean by simplicity and explainability and interpretability of these models? Um, so connecting to some of the points before. Or a very brief parting remarks. Yeah, yeah maybe what Mo was saying, I think I see it from another direction. Maybe, you know, it is related to the hum, 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 to be more humble. Maybe AI will make us more lazy and less humble, and then we miss we will miss many of the great discoveries that we could actually make. So we need to make more efforts. Okay, so the conclusion <laughs> is try harder. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the three panelists for the engaging discussion. Thank you for the crowd who was participating and stayed with us the whole way. Um, this concludes the second day of the school. Tomorrow we start bright and early at yeah. 9. Um, and we're, we're going tomorrow, I remind you, to have an uh, excursion in the afternoon. Hopefully the weather will be looking good. And so and just, dinner. what? And, dinner. and then we'll have dinner. Yeah, so even if you're skipping the excursion, you're invited to dinner. We'll give you full details tomorrow, but when you leave your room or your house, remember that we, we have an excursion in the afternoon. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.